Okay, here we're going to be going over chapter 48. Now remember chapter 48 covers a couple of different aspects. It has phlebotomy as well as capillary punctures and a few other types of um, blood tests. And so we're going to only cover about half of this chapter. Um, we'll be going over phlebotomy and covering the rest of it in the spring. Okay, so some of this chapter we cover and some of it we won't. Okay. And so I'll be jumping around a little bit with these slides. So the things that are covered in this chapter are talking about the role of medical assisting when we look at collecting, processing, and testing samples, um, carrying out the actual procedures for collecting a specimen. Um, an important feature here, which we'll discuss a little bit here, as well as with phlebotomy, is just ways of dealing with and responding to patients' needs when collecting blood. Um, some people can seem fine and okay until um, you tell them that you have to draw blood and there's definitely um, people that are very afraid of needles and so we always have to learn how to be empathetic and respond to the, the needs of patients when we're dealing with invasive procedures like blood draws and then the actual procedure for performing the blood test. Okay, so we'll cover some of this here and then we'll cover the rest of it in phlebotomy. Okay, so as far as what medical assistance role is, role, um, a lot of places do allow medical assistance to collect blood specimens, both by venipuncture or phlebotomy, um, as well as capillary punctures. And so we're going to focus in on uh, blood tests that revolve around the capillary punctures. Um, we've already done some wave testing, um, pregnancy testing, and rapid strips are wave testing. So here we'll actually be doing um, an H. pylori test um, as well as our glucometers and hemoglobinometers checking for blood glucose levels and hemoglobin levels. Okay, so the knowledge that's really important here is it's really now we're getting to a point where we're dealing with invasive procedures where we're actually puncturing skin and drawing blood and so that um, ability to be able to be confident and empathetic is very important. Okay. And so the knowledge needed is how to deal with patients and their fears with drawing blood and our needles, um, how to uh, properly obtain our blood samples, as well as the appropriate supplies and equipment that are needed for each um, type of blood test, and then how to perform and screen for those common blood tests. So as far as collecting blood samples, one of the first things that's important to do is review the test order. You always want to make sure you know what you're ordering um, and checking if there's any pre-test orders that need to be done. Sometimes you have to reschedule patients if they have not followed through with the appropriate pre-test orders. Um, assembling your equipment appropriately. You always want to make sure you have everything with you, um, but you don't want to have too much of everything. So you always want to make sure you're prepped and ready and you know what you're going to need. Um, and once again, the equipment and supplies will vary depending on what kind of test you're doing. Um, when you are doing phlebotomy, we will, be have, we will have collection tubes. And so those tubes need to be labeled correctly. Prototypically, they will label tubes with stickers after the procedure's done in case they're not utilized. Um, we always use alcohol for our normal um, venipunctures and or um, Capillary punctures, sometimes they use iodine if they're doing um, blood cultures, but most of the time blood cultures are done in a hospital setting, so we don't prototypically do that in a clinical setting, so alcohol is our most common um, skin disinfectant or antibacterial agent that we're using. Um, Band-aids are usually adequate for capillary punctures, but um, if you're doing a blood draw, then you would want to have something that can apply a pressure bandage for five to ten minutes, so usually we use coband. Some people just put a gauze with a band-aid, but um, generally having some sort of pressure bandage with coband is a good idea. If you are doing venipuncture, then you will use a tourniquet, which is a kind of a elastic material that kind of helps to um, draw the vein out a little bit. When we are doing capillary um, punctures, we don't need to use a tourniquet. So this is kind of a review on this thing, but we'll go through it again. So when we um, 
get our blood specimen ready, we prepare the patient, we greet and identify, we always double check the name and the birth date of the patient to make sure we have the proper requisition form. We confirm any pre-test preparation. Are they fasting? Did they need to fast? Um, always tell the, you know, explain to the patient what you're going to do. I'm going to do a capillary puncture. Or I'm going to do a blood, you know, then a puncture so that they know what's going to happen. Um, there are times we talked about what chain of custody is, and sometimes with blood tests there can be a chain of custody. Um, we can do urine tox screens. Sometimes they'll test blood for um, certain uh, toxicology screens as well. So just being aware of what the chain of custody is if necessary. And then being able to handle exposure incidents. And so when we're dealing with blood, especially when we're dealing with um, venipuncture, um, our needle, our unwanted needle sticks are what we have to be careful of. Okay, so making sure that we um, handle those appropriately, make sure that we're safe, and that the first thing we always do is put our sharp in the sharp stick. Okay, so the procedure that we'll be doing for this week will be the capillary puncture. And so what the capillary puncture is, it's also called a dermal puncture, um, where we do a superficial puncture of the skin. And the most common site for adults or children is going to be um, either the third or fourth finger, which is the middle or the ring finger. Um, we can use the heel, but that's usually doing um, like newborn or pediatric checks um, on infants if they're doing like bilirubin levels. So we won't be dealing with the heel, but that can be a site that's used. Um, we have automatic puncturing devices that automatically puncture um, at the appropriate depth so it doesn't go too deep. We don't want to go so far that we'd hit the bone because that could cause osteomyelitis. So these automatic puncturing devices go a certain amount, about an eighth of an inch, we just have to make sure that we press it consistently during the procedure. If you start to press and pull back, then you won't puncture the skin enough and you won't get enough bleeding, okay? And the specific um, automatic puncturing device that we use is called a Lancet. And there's a number of different Lancet devices. Um, the ones that we use um, are very similar to the ones that are in the picture there. And when we're doing some of these tests, when we're actually doing a hemoglobin test, I'm no, sorry, when we're doing a hematocrit test, we will use um, what are called micropipettes. They have a very, very small um, tubule that we actually can collect blood specimens. Some of our cholesterol tests can um, have use micropipettes as well as doing hematocrits and some other and some other blood chemistry tests. They're also called microtainer tubes. All right, and the other thing that we will be doing too is a smear slide. We'll actually take a blood smear um, and put it on a slide and take a look at it underneath the microscope. This is actually more of a moderate complexity test, so chances are you won't do this in the field, but it will give you an opportunity to look and see what blood looks like underneath the microscope, so it's, it's actually pretty cool. Okay, so what precautions should you take when collecting a blood specimen? You should always make sure that you're using the appropriate standard precautions. Um, we always assume that everyone has an infectious, um, has something infectious, and so we always treat everybody the same. That way, when we do come across someone that has an infection, we're not treating them any differently, okay? So we always want to make sure we use the appropriate PPE, and we always treat every single person with standard precautions. Now, one thing that's important um, with doing these blood procedures is that we always have to kind of take into consideration the patient's needs. Some people really do have a fear of needles, and so we have to be very um, empathetic, sensitive, as well as competent as we're going through this. And so you really have to be able to acknowledge um, the needs of the patient and the fact that some people really do have a phobia of needles. They are afraid um, of the pain, they're afraid of having it suddenly hurt when they're not expecting it. And so it's really important to make sure. That we take those needs into a, into account. Okay. And a lot of times patients will come up and they'll ask questions. And so always make sure that you give them straightforward answers, but to, to the best of your ability, but also within your scope of practice. If they ask a question that you're not sure about, 
it's always appropriate to go talk to the clinician and say, you know, this patient has some more questions about the blood test that you're doing. Answer what you feel comfortable with and what is within your scope of practice, but don't ever answer anything you're not sure of. Okay. Okay, so patients' fears and concerns. Okay. And so one of the first things they're afraid of is pain. And, you know, most of the time these things are pretty quick, but people really are worried about what kind of pain is going to be inflicted. So it's better to be upfront and say that they will feel a pinch or they will feel a stick, but that it's quick and that, you know, afterwards it should be fine. Okay. And so you always, you don't want to tell them they're not going to feel any pain, but just let them know that it's like a pinch and that it only lasts for a minute or two and then it goes away. Okay. Um, bruises and scars are always an issue. We don't really so much worry about that with um, the capillary punctures. When we do phlebotomy, a hematoma is always a possibility. That's where you get a collection of blood um, underneath the skin. And once again, if somebody uh, pokes through the vein um, or doesn't put a pressure bandage on it appropriately, hematomas can form. And so that is something that people are aware of. If they bruised severely the last time they had their blood drawn and you're going to be the next one in line, they oftentimes will let you, some people will be very upset and let you know the last person that drew my blood, they bruised me and I was in pain for a week after. So don't ever take anything personally and realize that sometimes people will take out on you what happened to them in the past. And so you always have to just acknowledge it and say that you're going to do the best you can to not hurt or bruise them. And so we always have to acknowledge those fears and concerns, okay? Some people are also afraid of the diagnosis. If they've come in with symptoms that they're worried about and blood tests are going to be done, there are people that are worried. And I think the biggest test um, kind of created fear over the past 15 to 20 years is just getting an HIV test done. And so that's why they've tried to make home tests and make it more available for people to be able to, do, to perform their own HIV tests. But I know a lot of people would say, I don't want to get one done because I don't want to know because they're fearful. And so that can happen um, with all sorts of different diseases, but that's one of the ones that kind of comes to my head. And I don't think this the bottom issue is as much of a problem as it was in the past. I think people are worried they're going to contact the disease from the procedure. Um, a long time ago, there were some issues with people getting certain infections from improperly autoclaved and, and sterilized materials with everything being um, one-time use. Um, I don't think we have as many people worried about that, but that's always an issue that someone might be concerned that the procedure will actually give them an infection. Okay, so one of the types of tests that we'll do in a, in a POL are called hematologic tests. And hematologic tests are um, prototypically certain components that are affiliated with a complete blood count, and that's also called a CBC. And so when we do a hematologic test, we're actually doing either a venous blood from a vein or capillary blood from a capillary puncture. Um, we don't prototypically do arterial um, tests. That's generally done by a respiratory therapist or someone who's more specialized. We usually focus on venous or capillary blood. And one of the things that we can do is a CBC. And so we can actually take a look, hematologic tests actually take a look at whole blood um, in different ways. You can look at whole blood underneath the microscope and smear, or we can put it in one of the small micro pipettes and spin it down and look at the hematocrit. And so um, when we look at whole blood, Whole blood has two components to it. It has the clear, straw-colored, um, watery portion called plasma, but then there's also formed elements. And the formed elements are consist primarily of red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Okay. Now, a CBC can give us a lot of information. It's a very commonly done performed test. I mean, it seems like a good chunk of the uh, blood tests that are drawn, this is one of the tubes that we're drawing. And so complete blood cell count gives us quite a bit of information. We can diagnose uh, a host of different um, blood disorders and even blood cancers just by doing a CBC. Different kinds of anemia can be diagnosed, different uh, leukemias polycythemia. So there's a lot of different um, blood disorders that can be diagnosed just by doing a CBC. 
And so when we do a CBC, first of all, we'll get a red blood cell count that gives us the amount of red blood cells in that whole blood. We also can get a white blood cell count. And so when we look at the white blood cells, if you remember from chapter 26, um, we have five different white blood cells, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, uh, monocytes, and lymphocytes. All five of those cells, the percentages of those cells within the blood should all equal 100%. And so movement up or down of those different cell lines can give us an idea on what kind of situation's going on. If our neutrophils go up higher than normal, that can indicate a bacterial infection. If the monocytes go higher than normal, sometimes that can indicate a viral infection. If the eosinophils are elevated, that can indicate either an allergic or a parasitic infection. And so movement of those cells can give us an idea of what kind of disease process might be going on within the individual. Other, another formed element are platelets. And if platelets um, are important because platelets actually um, aid in the coagulation process. And so platelets are free roaming, small little segments of cells um, within the blood. And their, their normal window of amount that's actually in the blood can vary quite a bit. And so the, the issue with excessive platelets um, can be that um, when we actually have little microtrauma inside the inside of the cells or in within the, the endo, endothelium of cells, um, platelets will sometimes stick to areas if there's microtrauma or if there's significant trauma like a cut because the platelets are responsible for making um, an instantaneous platelet plug whenever is necessary so that we can actually start the coagulation process. The problem is that if there's a lot of microtrauma or inflammation within the endothelium, then platelets can start to randomly stick to the inside of vessels. And then if a person has, we all have free floating cholesterol triglycerides in our blood. And so if we have elevated cholesterol as well, and those triglycerides stick to the platelets, we can actually start to get thrombosis or a thrombus formation. Remember a thrombus is a stationary blood clot. And then that blood clot could break off and roam around the system. And that's called an embolus. So platelets are very important, their function is, but um, depending on the disease process that's going on, platelets can actually contribute um, along with cholesterol uh, to form plaque formation with people that have uh, coronary artery disease, okay? Two other important things, and these are two things that we'll do in class um, that you can measure from a complete blood count is a hematocrit level and a hemoglobin level. And so both hematocrit and hemoglobin, sometimes you'll see it called H and H, um, they actually give an idea of how many, um, whether or not a person is anemic. Okay, so hematocrit is the measure of packed red cells um, within a sample of whole blood, and then the hemoglobin is actually the measure of um, that protein hemoglobin within the red blood cells. Okay, and so here you can see this blood sample in this micro uh, this micro container, this micro um, pipette is um, a whole blood sample that has been spun down and now it's in its element. So you can see the bottom part or the dark part is the packed cells. And then you can see the plasma is sort of the yellowish color on top. And so this measurement of this hematocrit is about 42 to 43%. My eyes aren't very good, but that's it looks like about where it's at. You put your um, the bottom part of the microhematic root tube at the zero line, and then you measure up. The top part of the plasma goes at 100, okay, because the whole, everything within here equals 100%. So at this point, this person has about a 42% hematic root, which means the rest of that would be plasma, okay? And we'll be doing that in class. Something else that we can do that's a hematologic test is called a differential cell count. And this is where we actually take a drop of blood and make a uh, blood smear. And then we can actually take a look at the white blood cells and the red blood cells underneath the microscope. And a differential cell count is actually um, looking at all the different kinds of white blood cells underneath the microscope and actually getting an idea for their numbers. Now this is a, once again, this is a moderate complexity test. You probably won't do this in Field, 
but it's a really cool opportunity to be able to see red blood cells and white blood cells underneath the microscope. Okay. And how this is done is we'll take a drop of blood and put it kind of close to the frosted end of the slide, and then we'll take a second slide and draw back on that um, on that drop of blood and then push it forward. And we get a thick end and a feathered end. And where we're trying to count these um, red blood cells and white blood cells are in that middle area. And um, and once again, this is kind of a tough thing, even just getting the proper motion and getting the proper um, getting the proper um, thick end and feathered end can be difficult. But once again, it's really cool to see the red blood cells underneath the microscope. <clears throat> okay, this kind of shows our microhermetocrit tube a little bit closer, um, and you can see that um, you have your packed red blood cells at the bottom. This is after it's been spun. Um, your buffy coat, which is right in the middle, is generally a mixture of platelets and white blood cells, and then you have your plasma on the top, okay? And so this is what happens after you stick whole blood in one of these tubes and centrifuge it down for five minutes. We also have to put a little bit of sealing clay at the end. If we don't do that, then the whole the blood sample will spin out and get all over the uh, centrifuge machine. When we actually analyze the hemoglobin, it's very similar to a glucometer. We have to put that blood sample um, in a situation where it actually undergoes hemolysis. And when you hemolyze the blood cells, you can then evaluate the color. And the darker the color, the higher the hemoglobin level, the lighter the color, the lower the hemoglobin level. Okay, and so we will be dealing with an automatic hemoglobin analyzer um, where you take whole blood and stick it in a um, glass cartridge, put it in the into the automatic machine, and then it will read out um, our hemoglobin level. And we have normal levels of hemoglobin. Generally, women have a normal hemoglobin level of 12 to 16. Um, men have a little bit higher, 15 to 18. Okay. And once again, that happens because females menstruate, and so prototypically their blood levels are just a little bit lower than males. Another test we can do is cell morphology. Remember, ology is the study of, and morph means shape. And so when we're dealing with a number of these disease processes um, within the blood, things like anemia, um, you can actually look underneath the microscope and the, the shape of the red blood cells um, can also give you some information. Sometimes the size of the cell is smaller than normal and that's called microcytic. Other times the color is a little bit more pale than normal and that's called hypochromic. And so um, you can actually look at the actual morphology and that can give you information as well. Certain morphology is associated with certain disease processes. Okay. Um, I'll just briefly mention coagulation tests. Um, this is something that is frequently done as well when patients have certain heart conditions, they have to take anticoagulant medication. And so frequent, um, frequently they have to come in and have tests that are called PT and PTT. And those are, um, those are um, prototypically done and in, in, oftentimes they're done monthly in order to evaluate whether or not the individual is taking the appropriate amount of anticoagulants. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in phlebotomy. Another test that's commonly done is called uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate. It's also acronymed SEDRATE or ESR. Um, this is a test that is a non-specific blood test checking for inflammation. If someone's got an inflammatory condition like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or some sort of autoimmune disorder, um, the set rate will oftentimes be elevated. It doesn't specifically diagnose any particular thing, but it sometimes can indicate that there's something autoimmune or inflammatory going on. And so you can see it has a specific type of tube that's drawn. You actually draw um, a blood tube and purple top, um, and we'll talk about that in phlebotomy as well. You're actually given an opportunity to do this in phlebotomy. Um, you'll put a blood sample within that special tube and it shoots all the way to the top. There's an anticoagulant in this special tube. And so what happens is it causes the cell to lyse. And so when you have an inflammatory process going on, then that lysing um, or that 
red blood cell falling to the bottom of the sample tube will accelerate and be faster than normal. And so it's a test that is um, read in 60 minutes, and then you record it as millimeters per hour. So the amount of millimeters that the blood lyses or falls within that tube can indicate whether or not that individual has got some sort of nonspecific inflammatory process going on. Another test that we'll do is a blood glucose test. Now this particular glucometer um, is a little bit different than the ones that we'll use in class. We kind of use um, uh, an, a, a glucose analyzer very similar to the hemoglobin test that we'll do. They look very similar. This is one that's more of a handheld one and a lot of the clinics will have these. Um, they usually come with individual strips that go inside the machine. Sometimes you put a full whole drop of blood on the strip and then it goes into the analyzer and gives you um, a readout. Sometimes you smear it on there. Sometimes you can't touch the, slide, the, 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 um, the strip. And so it is important to read the directions because they're all a little bit different. And so a lot of places will just have a portable one that you do. We'll be actually using an analyzer machine. Okay, but these are routinely done in POLs. Um, and so patient education is very important. A lot of times they will be carrying a log book and they're supposed to log their blood sugars in on a daily basis. Sometimes it's twice a day, sometimes it's three times a day, sometimes it's four times a day. And so making sure that the patients understand that they must carry their um, booklet with them every time they come to the clinic um, or bring the machine with them. There's usually a memory in there and it gives the clinician a chance to take a look and see what the average sugars have been. There is another test called a hemoglobin A1C and this is um, commonly used in maintenance with diabetics to actually check the average blood sugar over a three month period of time. Glucose molecules actually bind to hemoglobin and it can actually give you an overall picture of how that patient's been averaging over a three month period of time. And it can also measure the overall effectiveness of the treatment regimen that's being used. And so they used to send this out to the, they used to send this out to reference labs, but a lot of clinics are starting to have their, their own hemoglobin A1C machines on in-house. And so it's much quicker um, turnover time. There's actually some home units as well people can really get an idea of what's going on. It's still, it doesn't replace the daily blood sugars, but it gives you an idea, sort of an average of what's going on over a three month period of time. And the reason why it's three months is because red blood cells have a half-life of about 90 to 120 days. And so because they, they uh, roll over and reproduce every two to three months, we can actually get um, an overall average picture of what their glucose levels have been over three months because of that red blood cell turnover. Um, we won't be doing this test, but some cholesterol tests can actually be done by um, um, and so because cholesterol tests are done so frequently, um, they have developed a lot of um, machines that can be that can be located in a POL. Um, where you can actually do a capillary sample and it'll give you a full cholesterol test readout. Okay. Now we won't be doing um, any specific serologic testing, but serologic tests, remember serum is plasma without um, the coagulation or without the without the coagulation elements. And so a lot of tests are done on serologic or on the serum of blood. And you can actually use that serum to detect um, a reaction to either an antigen or an antibody. And so a couple of these tests are listed here. The two that are probably a little bit more commonly that you might've heard of are um, the ELISA test is actually um, a test that um, is used in the initial diagnosis of HIV or screening for HIV. Um, however, that test is sometimes falsely positive. So there is a confirmatory test, which is the Western blot, um, which is actually done to confirm if the ELISA is positive. And they have also developed some rapid screening tests, serologic tests, um, where you actually detect antibodies to certain specific types of infections. Um, we will be doing that. Um, the H. pylori test in class. And so it's very similar. 
um, waved test um, where you have a cartridge, you put a specific amount of blood sample with a buffer into a small little chamber, and then after a certain time frame, it will give us um, a positive or negative result. And these are also waved tests as well. All right, so let's just do a quick little uh, apply your knowledge here. The hemoglobin A1C is a type of chemical test, lysing RBCs or red blood cells, and then evaluating the color is what we frequently do with hemoglobin, okay, because we have to lyse those cells. The shape or form of objects, remember shape or form, the word is morphology. Identify bleeding problems. We kind of briefly talked about that, but when we're dealing with bleeding problems, we will do coagulation tests, which is C. The rate at which RBCs fall, we talked about that a little bit too, and that is an ESR, okay, or sed rate, or erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is A. Percentage of what are a percentage of each type of WBCs, um, that is a differential. And then an ELISA test is an example of a serologic test, okay? All right, so we went through about half of these um, slides, uh, and we will talk about the other half in phlebotomy, okay? So I'm going to end this here, and we'll go from there. All right.